Ultimate Marvel is an interesting case study of a surprise hit that slowly became a mess of misfires and attempts at constant revitalization. Oddly, there is an emerging mythology surrounding this imprint. This mythology suggests Ultimate Marvel was the savior of Marvel Comics, and it changed how the industry approached superhero properties. This is a slightly grand misperception that overlooks factors that contradict that narrative. Certainly, Ultimate Marvel contributed to Marvel's stability, and it did have an influence on the industry, as any high-profile work will do. Yet there were other elements in play. The industry itself was in a state of ennui. Innovation from all angles was necessary to revitalize interest in the medium. And one can't deny, Ultimate Marvel played a role in moving the industry forward. Its level of importance is the questionable factor. The prehistory to Ultimate Marvel is somewhat brief, but contains details and context that are quite relevant to the evolution of the Ultimate imprint. Due to poor sales and mismanagement, Marvel Comics was forced to file for bankruptcy protection in 1996. This allowed the company time to reorganize and take measures to secure its viability. To make a very long, convoluted story short, by 1998 Marvel was somewhat stable. But that status was tentative at best. In fact, for the next two years, Marvel lost its dominance over the comic book market. This was a position the company held for decades. For the sake of simplicity, Marvel Comics was owned by Marvel Entertainment, a company that also established Marvel Studios in 1996. Marvel Studios was established to assert more control over movie and television properties. Instead of simply licensing characters, this division developed scripts and properties like any operational movie studio. The success of Blade, X-Men, and Spider-Man not only stabilized the studio, its parent company, and by extension, Marvel Comics, but it gave the studio leverage to produce its own films. In 1998, Joe Quesada and Jimmy Palmiotti were exclusively hired by Marvel to launch the Marvel Knights imprint. This was done through their studio, Event Comics. In basic terms, Quesada and Palmiotti were a contracted publisher who were responsible for hiring creative teams and putting books together. This content was subsequently printed and distributed through Marvel Comics. It was a deal similar to the one between Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld when they produced Heroes Reborn for Marvel in 1996. Marvel Knights was part of the regular Marvel Universe, but slightly off to one side. It was, in spirit, an early precursor to the Ultimate Universe. While its content was somewhat more mature than the regular Marvel Universe, it was still quite traditional. But Marvel Knights did experiment and use independent or unknown creators. And like the Ultimate Universe, it had very few ongoing series, preferring to publish a wide variety of limited series instead. Notably, Marvel Knights launched Daredevil by Kevin Smith and Joe Quesada, The Punisher by Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon, and Marvel Knights Spider-Man by Mark Miller and Terry Dodson. In fact, Brian Michael Bendis and Alex Maleev's legendary run on Daredevil was a Marvel Knights title. This imprint was effectively shuttered in 2006. All of its titles and continuity would be seamlessly absorbed into the regular Marvel Universe. At the beginning of 2000, Bill Jemis moved into a position at Marvel Entertainment that essentially made him the publisher of Marvel Comics. One of his first moves was to replace then-editor-in-chief Bob Harris with Joe Quesada. From an outsider's perspective, this consolidated Jemis' power within Marvel Comics. By installing his own editor-in-chief, one with a proven track record and healthy industry relationships, he ensured he could make bold decisions and have someone likable on his side to enforce them. A few of these important decisions included putting an end to rampant overprinting. Jemison Casada limited print runs to what was ordered, rather than predicting what the demand for a title might be. They expanded the presence of trade paperbacks in the publishing schedule. Additionally, they courted non-traditional outlets, such as chain bookstores, to stock and display those items. They stopped submitting material to the utterly insignificant censorship board, the Comics Code Authority. And they worked with a variety of new and established talent that wouldn't have otherwise worked at Marvel. In summary, they streamlined the excess while experimenting with content to see what would stick with the public. One such experiment was the Ultimate Universe. Originally, Bill Jemis suggested wiping all of Marvel's continuity and beginning the entire line from scratch, much like DC did in 1985 with Crisis on Infinite Earths. Allegedly, this approach was put forward by Garib Seamus, the publisher of Wizard Magazine. He suggested the age of the characters and their history was a barrier to new readers. 
the audience couldn't identify with a character in their 30s. What they needed were teen characters without any history. This would give a new audience an entry point to begin reading and collecting. Joe Quesada suggested another approach. Instead of restarting the Marvel Universe and potentially upsetting the current fanbase, they could create a new universe populated by modernized young characters. Jemis agreed, and the Ultimate Marvel Universe was put into production. The Ultimate Universe launched with Spider-Man in 2000. It was written by Brian Michael Bendis and illustrated by Mark Bagley. These were two creators that had languished in the industry for years. Of the two, Bagley had a significant amount of credits, having steadily worked since the late 80s, most notably on The New Warriors. Bendis wasn't exactly unknown, but he hadn't firmly established himself in the mainstream. Prior to Spider-Man, he had produced the graphic novels Chinks, Goldfish, and Torso, all of which were published by Image, although they began as projects for Caliber. Not to mention, Bendis was writing Sam and Twitch for Todd McFarlane. He was, allegedly, the heir apparent to take over writing duties on Spawn. Early in 2000, he launched Powers with Michael Avon Oming, and his profile began to rise. So being asked to submit a proposal for a new Spider-Man series was a step up for this creator. Spider-Man only sold 54,000 copies in the direct market. But reprints and distribution through other sources actually raised the total sales to 354,000 copies. While X-Men would make a larger splash in the direct market when it arrived, Spider-Man was quite successful on its own. This suggests it built the audience that future titles would capitalize on. Or, perhaps more accurately, it generated interest in the ultimate line of comics. While sales predictably dipped for the second issue, they began to steadily increase afterwards. It settled into being a top 10 comic for a significant amount of time thereafter. Spider-Man was not a huge departure from the known mythos, although it greatly expanded on the premise, drawing out the origin over five issues. First and foremost, the series establishes character. Peter Parker and the supporting cast are filled in quite well, and comfortably settle into their roles. This approach, along with Bendis' more natural streamlined dialogue, made the series feel unique and noticeably different from the regular Marvel Universe. While still science fiction oriented, Parker gained his powers through a more grounded or realistic manner. Additionally, the discovery of those powers occurs over a period of time, and we witness Peter adapt to the changes he's experiencing. In some ways, it's a metaphor for hitting puberty and discovering one's body starting to change in surprising ways. This was a subtext that would be highly identifiable to the target audience. The next series to debut was X-Men by Mark Miller and Adam Kubert. By his own admission, Miller knew almost nothing about the X-Men. The proposal he wrote for the series was based on the Brian Singer X-Men movie. This lack of familiarity and lack of nostalgia for the X-Men possibly worked in his favor. His approach felt fresh to a degree, because he didn't know enough about the series to copy it. His style was to be more cinematic, like he had previously done on The Authority. Unlike Spider-Man, the X-Men are driven by plot rather than by character, and Miller takes no time to set up the scenario. There are good mutants, the X-Men led by Charles Xavier, and there are bad mutants, the Brotherhood led by Magneto. Finally, there are the Muggles, who fear this new variety of human beings. It is a reasonably basic action movie premise, with reasonably basic portrayals of well-known characters. Unsurprisingly, X-Men was more popular than Spider-Man. The first issue had direct market sales that doubled Spider-Man's debut. On the surface, that number sounds impressive. But to put it in perspective, it was on par with sales of Uncanny X-Men and X-Men. Certainly, it was successful, but its sales weren't outrageous. They were, in fact, average for an X-Men title. The next ongoing title was Ultimate Team-Up, written by Brian Michael Bendis and illustrated by a variety of artists. This 16-issue series appeared to be a way to introduce more characters into the Ultimate Universe, but it quickly became a showcase for artists more than anything. Notably, Hulk, Iron Man, and the Black Widow all premiered in this title before appearing in the Ultimates, as did the Ultimate reinterpretation of Nick Fury. The Fantastic Four also appeared here first, before they received their own title. For the most part, these characterizations would be utterly ignored in future appearances. As a series, it's rather novel, but mostly forgettable. The exception being issue number six. This issue contains what may be Bill Sienkiewicz's best pen and ink artwork of his career. It is astounding work. The Ultimates was a 13-issue series written by Mark Miller and illustrated by Brian Hitch. Technically, it was an ongoing series, broken up into different volumes. 
The first volume of The Ultimates may be the best expression of Miller's approach to creating a comic book that is a backdoor action movie pitch. It's loud, excessive, and uses stereotypes in place of characters. Contributing to its success was the political landscape when it was published, and The Ultimates reads like a reaction to the feeling in the air. It's likely not an exaggeration to suggest this series wouldn't have had the impact it did without Brian Hitch as the artist. He perfectly translated the action sequences onto the comic book page. As many point out, Miller is the Michael Bay of comic books. However, a director of that nature is nothing without an amazing cinematographer to bring these sequences to life, which is exactly what Hitch did. His attention to framing and lighting gave the series a certain degree of realism, which balanced out the overall levels of violence. Unfortunately, this also highlights the moments when the dialogue is ridiculous to the point of self-parody. What's hard to overlook is the resemblance of the Ultimates to the first Avengers movie. The team makeup is identical, and the plot beats are very similar. And Nick Fury, who had been the star of the end scenes in prior Marvel movies, is based on the Ultimate Universe character. The Ultimates was a very successful title, and due to reorders, it was the top-selling comic of 2002. Oddly, it never managed to be the number one comic on the sales chart during its run. Due to timing, other high-profile comics always outsold it. Frank Miller's Dark Knight sequel, Grant Morrison's New X-Men, and the relaunch of the Hasbro Toy Universe kept the Ultimates from the top spot during its initial run. All of these titles and their success established a firm basis to begin expanding the universe. At this point, a variety of miniseries began being published. The main interlocking thread between them all was they were crossovers with the Ultimates. The only exception during this period are the two Electra miniseries. Ultimate Adventures was also published during this time, but it was part of the You Decide Challenge and has no connection to the universe itself. Ultimate War was a crossover between the Ultimates and the X-Men. Ultimate Six was a crossover between the Ultimates and Spider-Man. The Ultimate Galactus Trilogy, which was made up of Ultimate Nightmare, Ultimate Secret, and Ultimate Extinction, would involve all the main characters of the Ultimate Universe teaming up with the Ultimates in some capacity. It wasn't explicit, but the unifying element of the Ultimate Universe was the Ultimates and their relation to the other titles. At the beginning of 2004, the Ultimate Universe added its final, ongoing title, Fantastic Four. This reimagined origin was created and written by Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Miller, with art by Adam Kubert. For the most part, it reads like something scripted by Bendis, especially The Beginning, which is a character-driven piece focusing entirely on Reed Richards and his early years. Instead of cosmic rays giving the team its power, a teleportation device created by Reed Richards malfunctions and infuses them with power. Victor Von Dom, who reprogrammed this device believing Richards had made an error in his calculations, is also caught in the blast. It works as a somewhat grounded origin story, despite a few contrivances that stand out. Like the Ultimates, this version of the Fantastic Four seems to be the basis for the failed movie from 2015. Unlike Spider-Man and X-Men, Fantastic Four didn't have a consistent creative team during its beginning years. After the opening arc, Warren Ellis stepped in as the writer. It was handed off to Mike Carey for a few issues, then on to Mark Miller, before settling into Carey's hands once again. Overall, there didn't seem to be a firm direction for the series. It lacked the sense of being an epic, pivotal title like it had been in the regular Marvel Universe. This year saw the end of Bill Jemis' tenure as publisher. In part, his success was offset by his hostility towards Marvel's direct competition, DC. Marvel, which was part of the You Decide Challenge, spent a significant amount of time insulting that company and certain individuals directly. Jemis also made many controversial statements to the press, with the obvious intention to generate chatter and interest in Marvel comics. In some respects, he was the dark version of Stan Lee. One that had no filter, charm, or self-effacing irony. Behind the scenes, Jemis allegedly dictated and micromanaged the creative direction of Marvel's titles. The only publicly known incident occurred when the writer, Mark Wade and the artist, Mike Waringo, both were fired or quit Fantastic Four when Jemis demanded a sudden change in direction for the team. Perhaps his worst offense was challenging the head of Marvel Studios, Avi Arad. Due to Jemis' public persona and the publishing decisions he made, Arad had some difficulty making deals for Marvel movies. As an example, allegedly, George Clooney was in talks to star in a Nick Fury movie. However, once he saw the Fury miniseries, done by Garth Ennis and Derek Robertson, he declined any further involvement. There was also a fair amount of outrage over the inclusion of Princess Diana as a member of the Ecstatics. This outrage led to the artwork being altered just before publication. 
With Marvel movies becoming an important part of Marvel Entertainment, the struggle between Arad and Jemis concluded with Jemis being removed as a publisher in 2004. While the first four years were successful and interesting, the next four years were a series of creative missteps that undermined the success of the Ultimate imprint. Iron Man is only worth mentioning because it and the follow-up miniseries were universally panned and derided. Both were retconned as an unrelated anime series in 2011. Wolverine vs. Hulk was a six-issue miniseries that is notorious for two reasons. The first reason being, it was written by Damon Lindelof, one of the creative forces behind Lost. The second more memorable reason is there was a three-year gap between the second and third issue. By the time the series concluded, the Ultimate Universe was a vastly different place. Ultimate Power is the first crossover between the Ultimate Universe and another universe, the one established in Supreme Power. It's nine issues in length, with three issue blocks written by three different writers, Brian Michael Bendis, J. Michael Straczynski, and Jeff Loeb. The pictures were the copy and paste stylings of Greg Land. Reed Richards sends probes out into the multiverse looking for a cure to Ben Grimm's affliction. One probe causes mayhem in the Supreme Power universe. That team tracks the probe's origin and enters the Ultimate Universe to arrest Reed Richards. All of the major characters of the Ultimate Universe then enter the Supreme Power universe to retrieve Reed. It is ridiculous and a low effort by all those involved. While the worst is yet to come, this miniseries is definitely the harbinger of doom. To use a Marvel metaphor, this miniseries is the Herald of Galactus. It is the Silver Surfer arriving to let everyone know the end is near. Oddly, during 2007, there were no new titles. Over the next year, the Ultimate Universe holds its breath, as the final year of Ultimate Marvel is about to begin. The bulk of 2008 is a prelude to the forthcoming event, Ultimatum. Presumably, the success of events in the Marvel Universe inspired a need for a similar event in the Ultimate Universe. There were two miniseries that acted as a prelude to this event. Ultimate Origins sets out to explain the beginning of the Ultimate Universe. Briefly, it all revolves around the creation of a super soldier to fight in World War II. It reveals that Nick Fury was the first iteration of that experiment. However, he escaped and hid after being activated. It also reveals that mutants are the spontaneous expression of evolution. They were actually genetically manufactured in Canada. The miniseries ends on the teenager, Rick Jones, being chosen as a herald for the Watchers. This is a development that won't be explored for a few years. It has no relevance whatsoever to Ultimatum. Volume 3 of The Ultimates is five issues worth of foundation for Magneto's forthcoming murderous rampage. It is replete with madcap shenanigans and characterizations that make almost no sense. Hawkeye is suicidal, an issue no one addresses except as an insult. Captain America sure doesn't understand these modern times, even though he's had plenty of time to adapt. For some unknown reason, Thor suddenly adopts a Shakespearean accent, like the classic Marvel Universe Thor, and Pietro and Wanda's incestuous relationship is highlighted, not to mention it suggested Wolverine is their actual father. Perhaps the opening panel featuring a sex tape of Tony Stark and Black Widow was not a poor taste way to begin the series, but a way to indicate this entire story is superhero porn. In fact, one could make a reasonable argument that it's a sleazy parody of the Ultimates. Instead of gratuitous sex, there's gratuitous violence and simple characters. All the women are overly sexualized objects, while all the men are flat, one-dimensional beings easily provoked into violence, or sex to continue the satirical metaphor. Except it isn't a parody or satire. It's just a barely coherent mess of edgy situations and terrible dialogue with utterly cheesecake artwork. All of these creative missteps are personified by Ultimatum, an event that did exactly what it was intended to do. It killed the Ultimate Universe. It didn't simply kill a vast amount of characters, it killed all interest in the imprint itself. Putting aside the story, which is a series of semi-coherent beats punctuated by moments of tackiness, Ultimatum was a gross miscalculation on all levels. Briefly, it suggested the Ultimate Universe was a dark, violent place where life is cheap. Furthermore, with the barest motivation, a character will set aside their morality and commit murder. Any sense of escapism was traded for rampant mayhem and nihilism. Tonally, Ultimatum seems to ooze sneering cynicism. While its intent may have been to clear the stage for a new direction, and to ensure this universe was noticeably different than the regular Marvel Universe, it was actually emulating the very thing it was distancing itself from. Marvel events such as House of M, Civil War, and Secret Invasion were proving to be rather successful, 
An ultimatum seemed to be an attempt to do an ultimate version of these mainstream events, except taken to the extreme in order to create controversy and generate sales. Instead, due to the stark, unnecessary brutality of the story, it did the opposite. It gave everyone an exit point. Following Ultimatum, the Ultimate Universe was rebranded as Ultimate Comics. As a result, Spider-Man, the only ongoing title, was rebooted with a new number one. During this period, a trilogy of miniseries, Ultimate Enemy, Ultimate Mystery, and Ultimate Doom, transformed Reed Richards into the villain known as the Maker. The Ultimates was split into two teams. The New Ultimates, which was the public-facing team, led by Carol Danvers, and the Ultimate Avengers, who do secret operations, led by Nick Fury. Naturally, these two teams clash in Ultimate Avengers vs. New Ultimates. Peter Parker, who is wounded during this fight, eventually dies at the hands of his nemesis, the Green Goblin. Effectively, this and the Fallout miniseries brought about the end of Ultimate Comics and the beginning of Ultimate Comics Reborn. Fallout begins as a eulogy for Peter Parker, but then becomes an introduction to the new status of the Ultimate Universe. The X-Men and the Ultimates got new ongoing series, as did Spider-Man, with Miles Morales in the lead role. With the exception of a few miniseries, that was all the Ultimate imprint offered for the next few years. It was a quiet, understated reboot. The borrowed concepts from the Marvel Universe, Spider-Man, the X-Men, and the Avengers, were now radically different from their inspirations and had become their own unique interpretations. Then the main Marvel Universe began to intrude. The first intrusion was the well-meaning Spider-Man miniseries from 2012. Peter Parker finds himself in the Ultimate Universe, where he meets Miles Morales. The entire point of this crossover was for Peter to give Miles his approval. It seems like a message directed at the readers more than anything. Conceptually, the story seems to be the basis for the animated movie Into the Spider-Verse. The second intrusion was the Marvel event, Age of Ultron. During this event, the actual timeline of the Marvel Universe breaks. As a result, Galactus ends up in the Ultimate Universe. No, this development does not make any sense. It just happens. This leads to the miniseries, Hunger, where Galactus and the Galactus Swarm of the Ultimate Universe merge. All of this is a prelude to the final event in the Ultimate Universe, Cataclysm. Cataclysm involves all of the Ultimate titles in an interlocked 21-issue series. Here the heroes struggle to find a way to stop Galactus from consuming the Earth. They do succeed, but the world is a broken place. The Survive one-shot was, again, a eulogy, this time for Captain America, who died during Cataclysm. And again, this one-shot establishes the new status of the Ultimate Universe. Concurrently, the Ultimate titles were rebranded as Ultimate Marvel Now, and the three core titles were rebooted once again. However, within a year, the Marvel Universe would intrude for a final time, and the Ultimate Universe would be at an end. Before that happened, Brian Michael Bendis would take this opportunity to revive Peter Parker within Miles Morales the Ultimate Spider-Man. His sudden reappearance is mostly unexplained, and his fate after this appearance is ambiguous. Secret Wars, the Marvel Universe event for 2015, was the culmination of a deep, long storyline written by Jonathan Hickman. The entire Marvel multiverse is destroyed, then combined into one planet, Battleworld. Ultimate End, the final official Ultimate Universe title, takes place on Battleworld. Marvel Universe and Ultimate Universe characters attempt to discover how their worlds merged. At best, it's a minor side story that takes place before the conclusion of Secret Wars. It lacks any sense of closure or finality. And it definitely goes out with a whimper, not a bang. Of all the various Ultimate Universe characters, only Miles Morales and the evil Reed Richards, now known as the Maker, would survive Secret Wars and endure to the present day. With that, the Ultimate Universe was officially shuttered. William Goldman, the author and screenwriter of Princess Bride and Marathon Man, famously wrote, Nobody in Hollywood knows anything. This was in reference to producers or studios taking credit for the success of a movie. The implication being they had the divine foresight to see a certain film would be a popular hit or a critical darling, or both. Truthfully, that is a lie. No one knows beforehand if any movie will be a financial or critical hit, or both. It's all a guessing game. This insight definitely applies to any commercial creative venture, like comics. The proof of that is the fact that if anyone knew what would be a guaranteed hit, they would only publish those titles. Instead, they throw everything at the wall to see what sticks. 
Sometimes you get an immortal Hulk or a Mr. Miracle. But sometimes you get a Mockingbird or a Heroes in Crisis. More often than not, you get something in between. From an outsider's perspective, failure and success seem obvious. Just make good comics, tell good stories. But it's not quite that simple. A lot of people have input into a project, especially at a corporate level like Marvel, and not one of these people can confidently state whether a specific title will be a success or not when it launches. But every single person has an opinion about what they think will work. In fact, the editor of The Ultimate Imprint, Ralph Macchio, thought Ultimate Spider-Man would only be a six-issue limited series. Even with the benefit of hindsight, one cannot positively identify what originally made the early Ultimate Universe appealing and successful. Was it the teen characters with no continuity? Was it the more grounded origins? Was it the quality of the writing? Was it the aggressive marketing? Was it the design of the covers? Was it just luck and timing? Or was it some factor that remains elusive and mysterious? Nobody knows anything. In the end, there is a bitter irony inherent in the Ultimate Universe saga. It became everything it was created to remedy. It was intended to be a streamlined antidote to the convoluted history of the Marvel Universe. But due to reboots, events, rebranding, and the simple passage of time, the Ultimate Universe and all of its creative teams discovered they couldn't reinvent continuity. Until next time.